He's responsible for these Starburst Foundation brochures that you may have seen wandering around here. And that's one of his current projects. He's apparently a man of many projects. He received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in Physics from the Johns Hopkins University in 1969. He has a Master's in Business Administration as well and a PhD in Systems Science. He has done quite a bit of research in respiratory protection. He invented a miniaturized pulsation dampener for air sampling pumps. He's got some patents on rebreather apparatus equipment. He also founded in the mid-70s a group called Solar Aquatics, a solar energy research firm. As a matter of fact, I'd heard of that while I was in the solar business at that time, and uh, it is some very significant work. He's also worked as a project consultant on solar energy for the Club of Rome. He's lectured extensively in the United States and in Europe. In addition to his work in microphysics and astronomy, he's also investigated the application of general theory of open systems to the fields of stock market theory, psychology, prebiotic evolution, and ancient mythology. So, without further ado, here's Dr. La Violette. In this journal, this sequence of three papers in here. Uh, basically, what it does is it replaces uh, quantum mechanics and a lot of other uh, theories in physics with a more unified approach. Uh, one of the problems in physics that I see is its fragmented nature. The tendency has been to uh, operate from observations and you construct theories. You know, sort of like the blind men and the elephant. You know, you go up and they say, ah, oh, here's what I say. They focus on a particular area and they devise a theory. And then another area and devise a theory. And then uh, later on, some guy comes to, uh, with needle and thread and tries to sew them together into sort of a patchwork quilt. Uh, just to give you an example of the inconsistency that this can uh, reach, uh, there's what's called the cosmological constant conundrum, which was discussed in Scientific American uh, a year ago, which sh shows that quantum mechanics, uh, or excuse me, the quantum electrodynamics theory and general relativity are mutually contradictory. These are the two foundations on which physics is formed. Uh, the idea being that uh, with quantum electrodynamics there would be so much mass in every millimeter of space that um, the gravitational redshift would be such that we couldn't be having this conversation because I would be in the radio region of the spectrum. In other words, the light, by the time it got to you, would be in the radio wave region. Uh, so this is a major problem in physics and it hasn't been resolved. Uh, what, what it would be good if you can uh, to wipe the slate clean of all the theories you've been taught and uh, just hold on to the observations and, to see this new approach. It's sort of like taking a journey to another area and uh, what I'd like to do is show you the door how to get there. Uh, I've been there for many years and I can understand how it might be difficult to grasp some of the, the, this new perspective because it is a, basically a totally new way uh, to uh, view physical reality. Uh, and when you've gotten there slowly, bit by bit, uh, it's much easier than all at once. But basically, uh, let me begin with this. This is an example of the Zabotinsky reaction. This is a chemical reaction that produces what are called chemical waves. This is what's called an open system. Uh, <clears throat> To relate this, to, before I get into this a little more, I'd like to say that what this physics theory relates to in the Tesla area is that it predicts uh, waves, electromagnetic, or I shouldn't say electromagnetic waves, I should say uh, radiation waves, light waves, radio waves, which uh, are very similar to what Tesla was talking about. He used the image of waves being like sound waves rather than like what Maxwell was saying where the waves are conducted through transverse motion. Okay, so 
the reason why subquantum kinetics makes different predictions than the Maxwellian theory is basically the model it uses for wave motion and for particles, subatomic particles, for example. Um, current physics has used what's called the mechanical model. In other words, it goes back to the time of Huygens looking at the ripples going across the Dutch Canal, and that became the model for light. Okay, that's the mechanical wave motion model. Uh, it was postulated there was a mechanical ether. The ether was something that was just a substrate and uh, waves were imposed on it. And as a result, you got all of physics, the formative years of physics were based on this model. Faraday, all these big names, they were working with a mechanical ether. The field concept developed in the mechanical ether. Uh, Maxwell's equations. And then the ether was abandoned uh, with uh, the turn of the century, it wasn't just proven, it was abandoned uh, with going to special relativity and uh, still the uh, equations were retained, which means the ether, mechanical ether was there, sort of like the grin on the uh, Cheshire cat still hanging in space. Uh, the thing is that around 20, 30 years ago, we suddenly discovered that there was another type of wave motion. These are called chemical waves. The principles are totally different. But looking at it from a historical perspective, this only happened at this point in history, at a time when physics was completely developed. Now, subquantum kinetics takes for the first time a chemical approach to physics. Not just chemical, but organic. In other words, the basics of this theory are essentially the same as what uh, the prin principles uh, as govern what happens in your own body. It's, it's in effect an incursion of biology, or I should say more generally, systems theory into physics. Um, when I first got this idea, I was very heavily involved in general system theory. I don't know how many people have heard of it. Anybody heard of general system theory? Okay. Uh, it's basically a viewing that the sciences have divided up nature artificially. And there's really only one science, that things happen a certain way and you can form general principles about it. Of course, you have modifications in different areas. But you can find in things called systems, like we are a system, uh, our organism, a cell is a system, um, this uh, chemical reaction is a system, uh, society, uh, subatomic particle, that there are certain uh, properties which they have in common. And uh, general system theorists are sort of like the honeybees of the sciences. They bring ideas from one field into the other. They cross-fertilize the disciplines. Uh, avoids reinventing the wheel. Um, so what, what I've done is take principles that were already developed in chemical kinetics and systems theory. Uh, I, I've drawn from people like von Bertalampe, uh, Ludwig von Bertalampe and his theory of open systems, uh, Ilya Prigogine, Nobel Prize winner, his work in uh, nonlinear dynamics, and I've applied them here uh, in physics. Uh, I postulate an ether, instead of a mechanical ether, a reaction diffusion ether. And uh, just as an example, uh, I always get tangled in quartz. Okay. It shows some of the uh, differences comparing mechanical waves to reaction diffusion waves. The mechanical waves, the carrier is inert, whereas in the reaction diffusion system, the uh, carrier is interactive. It's, under, it's m metabolizing. It's an open system. When I say open system, uh, I mean that it's in a state of flux. An example here, a very nice example, because it's actually a transmuting system is a candle. Now, um, presently it's an equilibrium system, but if we light it, it becomes an open system. In other words, the wax feeds the flame, and as a result of the transmutation of the, the combustion, we have the flame produced. The structure of the flame depends critically on the process continuing. Therefore, structure is dependent on process, which is not true in the uh, closed system models. 
uh, your body is an open system. If you were to stop eating, you'd find out very quickly. Uh, uh, society, uh, the example of the energy crisis of 73 when they cut off the oil supply, so what major impact it had. Uh, I'm suggesting also you know, Oh, yeah, yeah, a little dimmer. Uh, the universe also, I'm suggesting, is an open system, that there's a flux passing through the entire universe, through this room, maintaining everything in the room. So this ether is a, in a state of reaction, uh, whereas uh, the mechanical ether of the 19th century was, in effect, th at thermodynamic equilibrium, its entropy remained constant. Uh, entropy is always increasing in the reaction diffusion ether. When I say reaction diffusion, I mean that the molecules or whatever it's consisting of, the etherons, are both reacting with each other and they're diffusing through space. You see what I mean a moment about reacting. Uh, in the mechanical version, the carrier plays passive role, whereas in uh, this case of the reaction diffusion ether, it's uh, actually sustaining the uh, the wave. Excuse me, just a moment. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> waves are produced deterministically in mechanical case. Uh, here they rise; they can rise spontaneously. Here, uh, mechanical case, uh, waves require external stimulus. Here, uh, they can uh, arise. They arise out of the order in the reaction system itself. Think of it this way: Imagine a, a medium with waves. The the medium itself has a structure to it, in the sense of the way it's reacting with itself. And by postulating the mode of reaction, you can get different kinds of behavior at the physical level. See, you go to the with this physics, you, you start at the subquantum level, and you make a postulates about the, the way the ether is reacting. And there's an infinite number of models you can propose at that level. And you, you model the models to see what they predict at, on, in terms of what kind of waves emerge and you look to see if it's realistic. Is it something that behaves according to what we see as physical reality? It's a totally different approach to, uh, to physics. It's a modeling approach rather than an observational approach. Uh, every time you talk about ether, uh, it's good to uh, mention the silver tooth experiment was recently done and it's shown that the uh, it's for the first time, it's shown that we are moving with respect to an absolute reference frame. Uh, he took two laser beams and aimed them at each other, produced an interference pattern, standing wave pattern, and measured the distance between the nodes. And he found that the nodal separation was a function of the direction it was aimed. And from this, he was able to calculate the speed of the Earth relative.